So we're going to spend some time this morning um, uh, about, you know, this biblical based uh, concept of parenting. But as we approach Thanksgiving, you know, there's a lot to be thankful for, you know, uh, and uh, we are very blessed people by and large. Uh, and uh, and I think when you sit around the table, uh, you're very thankful for your family. And uh, I think that one of the things that that um, as a church, we're very thankful for is that we have such a large number of young people. I have family who visit here from time to time, and that's their comment. They say, everyone here is so young. And I said, well, thank you. And I said, no, I'm talking about the kids. And I said, oh, you know. Um, but, but yeah, we have, we're, for a congregation our size, we are well blessed. And uh, I've often thought if, uh, if what we need to do is do a little study and find what the mean age of the congregation is, what the average age is, probably make a lot of us feel a lot younger, you know. Hey, I go to a very young church, so... Because we do, we are blessed, and, and and you families who make a commitment in the work here, you bless us uh, just by that. But so we're very blessed for that. And, and when you look at it, our children are probably one of our greatest assets here at Netherland. Uh, it, it's been often said the kids are the church of the future, and I would argue pretty strongly the kids are the church of today. Because if you don't have kids in the church today, you won't have a church in the future. And so you sort of have to mindfully sort of focus your effort in and around that. Uh, and I think that that is, you know, trying to be godly parents and, and, and grandparents and aunts and uncles and, and brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to be aware of some of these issues that, that, that are critically important. But specifically, not just what we think, but, but what does the Bible say, you know. And the Bible says a lot about raising kids. Uh, when I really got into it, I guess that's what I sort of what wow. You know, there's so much text there, so much information, and that speaks to not just the parents, but 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 the grandparents, and and and, and really to the church as a, as as a whole. So there's a whole lot in there about about how how the how we should raise kids and raising kids in a biblically informed, godly way. Uh, a few years ago, there was a psychologist. His name was Doctor Spock, uh, and uh, he wrote a very popular book about how to raise kids. Uh, and people, you know, bought the book and they try to you know, raise their children according to Dr. Spock. What we discovered is that his child rearing techniques really led to a bunch of neurotic, narcissistic people, you know, that, that, that really just weren't very healthy. Uh, and when you get away from the biblical base principles, you're going to get side rails. You know, uh, when you lift, listen to just the wisdom of man, you know, I'm sorry, folks, Dr. Phil should not be telling you how to raise your kids. You know, or Oprah's chosen books or whatever. You need to be going back to God's word, you know. And even science and even research, which I, which I believe in and, and I, I teach things like that. But it's limited in its understanding. Okay. Uh, but but we, it's not that we can't draw from it. But still the Bible is a source that we need to go to. This is the pr- passage that came to me immediately when I start thinking along this line. The Proverbs 20, 22 verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, do not depart from it. Now, I know there's a lot of discussion as to, is this vocational training, which the text may imply you teach him a disposition or a trade or whatever, or is this biblical training? And, and I think both, both shades of meaning just work really well here. But that, that as a child is, is, is raised and grown, and the values you instill, the principles that you teach are critically important. There's an old saying, as a twig is bent, so grows the tree. So dispositionally, whatever you establish early in life becomes a, a, a template, if you will, of way relating later in life. And tonight, particularly, we're going to talk about relationally speaking, how important this is. Those early experiences can be very, very important about how people grow up and relate in life. And, you know, as a counselor and working with people, sometimes I realize that people had some pretty rough stuff happened early and have a hard time as adults with relationships. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But, but so we, we, we have this belief and, you know, and I think for some of us, we want this to be an insurance policy that, that we, you know, we're going to take our children to church, keep them in church and everything's going to work out just fine. It don't always work out that way. I think the, 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 the text here says, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Mark Twain left home as a teenager and he came home in his early 20s. And he made some statement to this effect. He says, I was amazed at how wise my father got and smart he got in four years. Because he wasn't until he came back home, he realized that, hey, 
dad knew what he's talking about. There, there was some, there, there was some principle in this and that sometimes you begin to have to grow toward understanding and appreciating what you've been taught in those lessons. So this is sort of a biblical principle. Let's look further though. We need to listen to God's word because God's the ultimate authority. In fact, when we look at children, we have to understand that they are our blessings from God. Right? Our church is blessed. To have, they are our blessings from God. But who do they really belong to? God. So really, you're responsible for raising souls that God has entrusted you with. God has entrusted souls here to this church, and God wants us to raise them in a specific way. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit specifically to dads, but, but, but this morning, we're going to start looking at some overall biblical principles. So this is what's so important. This is what's critically important, that from birth on, you get this. So the little bitty babies that we're asking for teachers for this morning, they need teachers because some amazing things happen in the first five years of life. At birth, a child's brain's about one-fourth the size of an adult's brain at birth. Yeah. It's, it's really not connected to good. Okay. It's the child's experiences that begin to get hardwired in. And we thing called neuroplasticity the brain can learn about anything so those early formative experiences become very important but by the time it's three years old in the first three years of life it gets 80 percent of the child the size of adults brain in the first three years of life and by the time they start school guess what they're 90 percent of adults brain by age five so those early formative experiences are critically important in knowing god and they might not be able to do nothing but pat the Bible in the, in the nursery class. Or they may be learning to, to, to sing Jesus Loves Me a million times, as John said, that, that Josiah said it's, he'd sung it by five years old. About a million times, he asked him the other day. How many times Ricky sang Jesus Loves Me? About, 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 about a million. It's critically important in those formative years to get biblical principles instilled in this brain, this developing brain. I heard it many years ago when, when I studied developmental psychology. By the time you're 10 years old, you've learned 80% of the things you're going to know the rest of your life. I think that's not quite right. Then why do we keep going to school? You know, somebody say, hey, I'm 10, can I quit school? Okay. This other stuff's just knowledge. But basic things like walking and talking and eating and sentence structure and grammar and language and all these other things. But by the time you're 10 years old, 80% of everything you know is already established. So that's what's critically important to expose kids early on to God's principles and God's teaching and God's way of looking at the world. It's critically important to do that because you have a very small window of time. So it's really important for us this morning to consider these principles. So we're going to look at the biblical directives for child rearing. And this applies to everybody. Number one, <laughs> Let you know, that's all we're talking about this morning is number one. There's three points, but number one is what we're going to talk about this morning. Number one, teach your children about God. If you don't, who will? You know, there used to be a world in which God was openly recognized. And you went to school, and most of us remember, we went to school and we had Bible reading in school. We had devotionals in school. We, we, we sang, oh, went talent roadie, then we sung a church song in school in the morning devotional. That's how it would. We said the Pledge of Allegiance. We read from the Bible. That's how we used to do it. That's so foreign to our kids today. We had people who, who sort of stood up and represented God. The church and the school and the home were sort of in partnership together. But that's not the way it is anymore. So we have, a, we have a biblical mandate, if you will. Five times in the book of Deuteronomy. Five times in the book in which God gave his law to his people. Five times in this book, God says, teach your children about your faith experiences. Teach your children about me. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. 
Only take heed to yourselves and diligent keep yourselves, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and grandchildren. Verse 10. Especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb when he gave them the Ten Commandments. When the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me and let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days of life, and they may teach their children. So Deuteronomy chapter 4, 9 and 10, teach your children and grandchildren. Teach your children. Teach your children what? Teach your children about your experiences with me. Tell them about me and you. Tell them about how you came to know me. Tell them about how you, you, that, that, how, how you, how you experienced me in the wilderness. Tell them. I think that parents could do a good job this afternoon just telling your children about the day you were baptized. Tell them about what life was like growing up for you. Who were, who were the meaningful spiritual mentors in your life? To have that kind of conversation with people. Because many kids don't know that experience. Well, how did that, you know, you know, they just assume. But to tell them about your experiences. Again, Brother Jerry read from the first part of this. But Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. And these are the words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And you talk of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. So when do you teach your kids? All the time. At home, when you lay down at night, when you get up in the morning, when you're walking by the way, what do you be talking about? God. If parents were as diligent about talking about God, are they about installing, instilling sports, athletics, all the extracurricular, if they were as diligent by that, about talking God as they are that, we would have a different culture. I'm just telling you. I had a situation recently with an adolescent male, and he's been, been sort of misbehaving pretty badly. And I just said, okay, your parents have taken your cell phone, they've, they've grounded you, they've done all these things. What's the one thing they could take away from you that would make you change your behavior? What's the one thing that could really get your attention? He said, basketball. And I looked at his mom and his dad. And they said, they won't do that, will they? And he says, no, they won't. Because my dad says, you, you can't mispractice. You're on a team. You can't let your team down. So that was more important than the child's misbehavior. And dad says, but you understand, he, he has talent. He, he, he might get a scholarship. And I thought, well, he could also wind up in jail. But there's parents who would never think we can miss a practice. We can't miss a practice. We can't miss a practice. We can't make, oh, we're not going to church tonight, though. They would never think missing a practice is okay. But missing the assembly of the Lord's church is okay. What values are you teaching? What's the message you're getting across? Are you living this command? Are you saying this is important? This is diligence. When we get up, when we lay down, as we go down the line. Is this what you're teaching? Deuteronomy chapter 11, 18, 19. Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand. They should be of the frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. How many times do you got to say this? This is important. In fact, the Jews took this literal. They would actually take little pieces of God's word, put them in a little box, strap them onto their kids' arms, and put them on between their, their forehead. You see it today. Conservative Jews will do this. Little pieces of God's word bound on their hands. They would take them with leather and wrap them on their hands, put that little box on their arm or on their forehead, sometimes both. And they had pieces of God's word in it. So they would not forget God's words. It's impressive. And they put this pictures up here. As Israeli soldiers. In battle gear. With their phylacteries on. God's word bound to the arm. And bound to their head. That's how they took it literal. How important are these principles? Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. If you can't remember it, 
Make it into a song. And that's what God says. I'm going to give you a song. And I want you to give this song to your kids. Now, therefore, write down the song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths that this song may be the witness for me against the children of Israel. So God says, listen, if you can't get any way, learn it in a song. I think seeing, singing and, and, and teaching and reading and all these things are critically important in the development of our children and helping them understand who God is and how we relate to Him. Psalms 34, verse 11. David says, come you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Now, we're not trying to make God out that he's just out to make you mess up and God's just out to punish you. That's not what David means here. David means here to understand God, to, to understand his, his awesomeness. We use that word awesome too, 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 too quickly today, too easily to describe, I think the only person he can describe is God, right? It's not a food. It's not a car. It's not a sports team. It's not an outfit. It, it's nothing that, 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 that should be used to, that word should be reserved for God, I think. David wrote this, Psalms 111, verse 10. And this was sort of proof text to me that, that they did things very intentional back then. David wrote this in Psalms 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Most of us want our kids to be smart. They want to be smarter than us. We educate them. We make sure they get their schoolwork done. We make sure they do well in school. Send them to college. We do whatever we can, training, vocational, whatever it is, to make sure. We put a lot of premium emphasis on this. Do we do the same with our knowledge and understanding of God? Do we put that same level of emphasis in it? David says to know God is the beginning of wisdom. Now, how can they know God? Well, they can't know God if you don't know God. That's one principle. Clearly, the Deuteronomy text says, you do what you've, been, what you've experienced. You put this in your hearts, so you can put it in their hearts and their minds. So you've got to know your own experience with God. And so you, you have to have a love for God that transcends everything else. So you can impart this. But it's beginning of wisdom. Now, here's, the, here's what was really important to me to read. Because as I begin looking at the text and the text and the text for the lesson, I begin to realize that Lord David wrote Psalms. Who wrote Proverbs? Solomon. Now, what was Solomon's relationship to David? He was his son. Okay? So, there's a little biblical plagiarism going on here, okay? Because Solomon writes the same words his father wrote. Solomon says, on more than one occasion in the book of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So I believe that David's interaction with his son, David instructed him in the ways of the Lord. He's quoting his father. The, be, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He's carrying on what he's heard. And so there's a pattern here that we see in Scripture that, that, that we've got to instill this understanding and appreciation of who God is very early on. Neuroscience has taught us some interesting things, and this is what we know currently. Remember I said that that, that little baby's brain, by the time it's five years old, is 90% finished? And we used to think that maybe the time they hit puberty, they got like 18, it's finished, it's done, done. We now know the last part of the brain to finish is called the prefrontal cortex. It's this part here behind your forehead right here. It's the last part of the brain to fully develop and come online. We now know that it doesn't finish to the early 20s. Maybe 24, 25 for some people. So you think, well, what's the difference in that? That's a really important part of the brain because that's the part of the brain where your second thought is. 
You know, when you say on second thought, you did, you can thank your prefrontal corner. People six year old will do stupid, crazy stuff. They'll get on top of the house. You know, there's a ladder. Let's go see what is that? You know, they'll just run it right there. Okay, I don't do stuff like that. My prefrontal cortex came online and says, "Wait a minute, you're going to fall." You know, on second thought, I won't do that. Okay, we give. Sorry, folks, we give sixteen year old car keys, and they'll do stupid stuff with cars that you won't do when you're. 36 or 46 or 56 or 66. Not that your car can't do it. It's just, on second thought, that's not a good idea. Okay. Things about making decisions in judgment doesn't come online to the, then. So when does this instruction need to stop in God's ways? Preschool age? Middle age? It never stops. Because that brain is still being developed and being formed. And then if we do it right, guess what? It becomes God-shaped in God-based instruction. Train up a child in the way he, is, he should go, and when he is old, and not depart from it. We really need to take this part serious. So the question is, how are you doing it? I mean, are you doing it at home? Great! I mean, that's good. But what else? Where else? I mean, we have a Bible school program here. It, 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 it's, you know, part of what would help support and enhance what you're teaching at home. They're really, really limited what they're going to do at school. Okay? Now... <laughs> Apart from maybe seeing a, a professional athlete give God a, a thumbs up or a point toward heaven when they score a touchdown or you make a home run, I may, may you get that every once in a while, but you don't get them teaching a lot. Do you want culture to tell your children about God? Or do you want to do that? You know, as we look at some changes and transitions here at, at church, you know, one of the things the elders have really said that, you know, they want a tremendous emphasis on education for our young people. Why? Because that's what God has called them to do is being spiritual leaders. They're looking to the biblical principle that God's established. You have to do this. You have to be proactive. You can't be passive. It's not going to work. You can't, you know, kids are sponges, but they're not going to take on all the good stuff. They're usually taking the bad stuff. You have to be intentional. You have to be proactive. And as the text implies in Deuteronomy, you can't take a day off. It, it, it was daily as you sit up, as you go down, as you walk away. It was daily. It wasn't, okay, we only do this two, three days a week. No. <laughs> it was consistent pattern of teaching them about God. It's a mindfulness about God. <clears throat> so what are you teaching? When are you teaching? Is it the Deuteronomical pattern? All the time, every day? And we must take serious the command to teach. We cannot neglect it. The culture's changed. God is not on everyone's mind. Words of praise to God are not everyone's lips. It is a it is a somewhat scary world that we live in right now, and we are raising our children to live in it. In fact, There's an educator uh, from England, and sometimes um, uh, um, I play his stuff uh, in some of my classes. Uh, Sir Ken Robinson, he, and you, he's got some neat things out there that he's put out. But he said it this way. It was really interesting. We are educating and training children today in a world that does not yet exist.
Things are changing so fast. So quickly. That the world that they're going to live in doesn't even exist yet. It's a new world. I remember years ago, <clears throat> partly because I really wanted one, uh, and it felt like it was a good justification. I was preaching here, and uh, I used to write my sermons out long-handed, you know, in a, in a spiral notebook, and I have a few of those somewhere. And uh, I asked Tammy, I said, Tammy, I said, you know, if I'm going to keep this preaching thing up, you know, I said, I'd like to get a computer. And back then it was the 286, IBM 286. Okay, and I'm talking foreign languages, some of you I know. Okay. And Tammy says, who needs a computer? No one has a computer at home. And I said, but I really think I could use a computer at home. I said, help me with my teaching and my sermon and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, and it comes with a printer. It's one of those dot matrix printer. You know, some of you don't know. What, you know, you know, you've know, you had the accordion paper you put in it. Like that. And she says, well, get it. She says, but I would never use it. That was a little over 20 years ago. She has more computers than I do now. My mom's 81 years old, and her biggest concern this weekend was, how do I get more apps on my iPad? Mom, how you doing? Fine. You know, can you help me get more apps on my iPad? I can't. She was, I'm blocked somehow, you know. The world we're in now didn't exist 20 years ago. So if we do not go back to foundational biblical principles, to the things that are timeless, to the things that should not change, that do not change, if we cannot instill that, how in this world will they be equipped to live in the future world? How? And as we, as an area of emphasis and an area of being intentional in this, how are we doing as God's people? So now then we have to place proper emphasis on teaching our children about God and His will for them. Number two, you have to discipline your children. Proverbs. He's familiar with the concept. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Uh, my grandfather was born in a different century. He was born in 1885. My grandfather lived to be 103 years old. My grandfather never spanked me a day in his life. One word from him changed me. But sometimes my mom would say, I'm going to whip you. I'm going to whip you. And he finally says, if you don't quit lying to him, I'm going to whip you. Because he was a person that says, don't threaten. If you're going to use discipline, use discipline. The scripture says, do it promptly. You know, I know ladies sometimes, and maybe, maybe it's in some houses, it, 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 maybe it's some houses, just a mom. But tell a child, wait till your father gets home or wait till your mother gets home may not be necessarily the, be, the best thing in the world as far as discipline. It, it appears that consequences soon after behavior are more meaningful than those on down the road. And so it needs to be very mindful of that. So the scripture says that you, if you don't discipline, you hate your child. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't hate my child. Uh, Bomberin, I think is the guy's name. He identified three different patterns, uh, three different ways that parents sort of approach this discipline. Uh, uh, discipline. He said, some parents are authoritarian. Do it because I said so. Some parents are permissive. Now, honey, you might not need to do that. You shouldn't do that. Now, honey, you know, you know better. You know, honey. Okay, permissive parents. Okay. But he said that, that Bomber discovered that the most effective parenting was authoritative parent. Because I'm the parent. That's why. That they don't mind explaining to you why you can't stick your finger in your brother's eye. You know, it's nasty for one thing. And they might get an infection, put his eye out. Okay. But it's still, you're not doing it because I said you're not doing it. So what happens with the, that really strict set of parents, when these people become adults, they don't know how to behave. They're a wild child. You know, they just sort of, they don't need parameters. They're sort of thrown off them. They get rebellious. The permissive ones are just sort of meandering through life. Now, what we see today is that a lot of people sort of took that permissive parenting approach. And we now have 20 and 30 and 40 years old who still don't know how to grow up. They're still big kids. 
because never, no one ever really set the boundaries for him. No one ever reflected back to him. So God says that you have a responsibility to parent your kids. So Proverbs twenty nine seventeen, correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give you delight to your soul. Discipline leads to harmony. If you know what the rules are, you know what the expectations are, and that's firmly established. And here's the big key, parents. It's this word, it's consistency. It was wrong yesterday, it's wrong today. It was wrong this morning, it's wrong. So being a consistent parent, is it's hard. I mean, and you know what most parents discipline on? Their level of fatigue. I'm too tired to fight about it. So the child gets away with it. Or their level of frustration. I'm going to whoop you this time for doing it. I'm, you're, you're in trouble now. So your level of emotional stability sometimes reflects your ability to parent. So you have to do it promptly and you have to do it consistently. And it says, and he or she will give the light to your soul. Proverbs 12, verse 1, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction. I'm sorry, folks. I didn't even know this was in the Bible. The word stupid. Did you know that? I was shocked. You put this lesson again. I didn't think stupid was in the Bible, but it is. It's related to the parent who won't discipline. So he who loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who has correction is just stupid. So the ideal, if you don't appreciate discipline, if you don't appreciate correction, it's a challenge. I mentioned double novel soy class this morning. I met with ladies recently. She's recently widowed. Her husband died in April, and she's sort of really struggling with it. And we talked about maybe some things that she could do to help sort of reenact her back in the community. She's a retired school teacher. She taught uh, second and third graders for most of her teaching career, 30-something years in classroom. And she says, I, I used to love kids. And she says, but I can't stand them anymore. They get on my nerves. And I says, what happened? She says, you can't discipline kids anymore. She says, I get in trouble at church. She says, if I see a child misbehaving in church, says, I'll call them down. You know, you don't do that. You don't stand in the chair. You don't, you know, throw books in the floor. You don't, you know, she's, I'll, and she said, and parents get upset with me. She says, I can't work with these kids today. And there's a certain truth to that is, is that, that we have to look at raising a children as sort of be a collective responsibility. You know, it's multi-generational for one thing, uh, but also it's something that we all have responsibility for. Uh, as we talked about the youth ministers, well, we didn't talk about, you know, they have to do everything, but they coordinate with other folks and being involved in things. We can't put it all on just one person. It's everyone's responsibility. But whoever loves instruction, loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Now, that's not just correction of children. That's about our correction, too. Sometimes we all need to be put back on the straight and narrow. In the New Testament, referring to passages in the Old Testament, it says that, that as a father chastens his children, the Lord chastens those who he loves. So part of this discipline is because you're loved. Not because you're not loved, but because you are loved. So discipline becomes a, a big responsibility for parents to do this and be consistent in that as well. The Bible instructs the discipline of children. Okay, now listen, guys. Okay, you got to pay really close attention to the next verse. Ephesians 6, 4. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And it, in, in some respects, we've now gone back to point one, right? <laughs> Teach your children. Okay. Now, this passage here puts a responsibility squarely on the father's shoulders. It's not mother's responsibility. It's father's responsibility to train and instruct. And I think dispositionally, guys, sometimes we think, well, they're just better at it than we are. So we think, I'm going to take the pass on that. We'll let them teach them about Jesus and, and sing the church songs and, and do the Bible lessons. No. Paul says, fathers, you assume responsibility. When men abdicate responsibilities, we have trouble. That's part of our culture today, I think, is that men have sort of quit being men. And I think we have a lot of young men who just grow up confused. They don't know what a real man is, you know, and so that they don't have an identity of what a godly man looks like. And I think because they've just not seen it modeled very well. So if Paul says, fathers, 
Don't provoke your children wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. You know, when I was putting this lesson together and reading this text, it reminded me, really interesting, Genesis chapter 3. It reminded me of Adam's nature, which sometimes comes down our DNA and our nature. Remember in the garden, when Satan says, hey, look at this fruit. Don't it look good? Mm, it's yummy, Eve. It's, it's going to make you wise as God. You won't need anyone to tell you what's wrong. And Eve looked at it, and it was enticing her, and she ate it. And who was with her when she ate it? Adam. Being passive, not speaking up for God, not saying, wait a minute, God spoke to us, and hey, we're not supposed to do that. Being passive and doing it. You know, it's like he gave it, you know, if Eve doesn't drop dead, maybe I'll have some too. You know, he's using her as a sort of a spiritual guinea pig. And here again, we're having to address men's passive natures. Fathers, do not be passive. Be proactive. You train them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. How are young men going to be modeled on how to love God and serve God if they don't see the meaningful men in their life do it? And too often, as they get older, the church begins looking at something. Oh, that's just for women, old people, and little kids. That's not what I belong to, you know. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, I can hoik and spit, and you know, and cuss like the rest of them. So I don't in church. If they're not seeing godly men model how to be godly, how are they going to find their way? So we can't be passive about discipline and spiritual instruction. It just can't be. You can't do Bible-based parenting and not teach. You can't do Bible-based parenting and not discipline. You discipline those that you love. You teach those you love. These are biblical principles, foundational biblical principles. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. This is a prophecy that, that's given to Malachi, but it's really interesting when you read it. It says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the hearts of the children to the fathers. Lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So here is. If you look at it. It's a prophetic statement about the coming of John the Baptist. That John the Baptist is going to come. As a. To herald and, 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 and heed people. You know. That the Lord's day is coming. Okay. So Elijah the prophet. John the Baptist is referred to that. And he says, listen, he said, and the, the problem is we need, to, we need to do a correction here that the hearts of the fathers are not turned to the children, the hearts of children are not turned to the fathers, that we need to do a foundational change in how people relate to each other. That men have to have their hearts turned toward their children and children have to have their hearts turned toward their fathers. It, it's sort of an interesting concept, but, but it really reflects the brokenness of the world. In our urban areas, the crime and violence among young men is just astounding. Astounding. We hear about it. We, we hear about, you know, you know, people killing, young people killing, you know, and blowing into gangs and, 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 and you know, and it, it's just, it's as if they've been abandoned to sort of become grown-ups on their own. And they find violent and cruel ways because that's identified as being manly. And so it is as if it's a broken world that Malachi is describing and it's somewhat the world we live in. That, that sometimes parents are so, so bent on what they want that they sometimes neglect what their children need. So the world... Our world and the world of our children is a scary place. You just can't hardly see the news. You just can't hardly see what happened just in Scottsville, Kentucky. A young girl within moments fell in the hands of a predator. Was savagely attacked and killed. Folks, that's within a few minutes of here. And you just don't think about how broken and evil this world is. 
And so the community of faith, the church, it, it should be a place of safety and a safe haven. But it only is going to work if we put a priority on teaching and discipline and being the kind of godly men that God calls me and godly women that God calls me because this world is a scary place. And the world they're going to inherit, it's getting scarier by the day. What this world really needs is Jesus. Amen? He's the Prince of Peace. Not everything the government should rest, according to the prophet Isaiah. On his shoulder, everything should rest. And so what this world really needs is Jesus. And if we know that, that he is the Prince of Peace, he's the only answer to the peace, this is something we need to carefully consider as the people of God. We need to evangelize the world as if our child's life depended on it. Right? If we get serious, now I'm not saying that, that I'm equipped to talk to someone from a different culture, but we should invest in people who can. We should begin evangelizing our community and our neighborhood and you know, you know, every place that we can because if Christ is the only answer to the broken world, if we have the gospel and we have the truth and we have what we believe is the access of Jesus and we don't share it, guess what? We're letting the world just die around us. We would think it cruel if someone says, man, I have a headache and you're walking around with aspirin in your pocket. Oh man, my headache's busting. Oh, my head's busting. My head's busting. Oh, it's busting. And you know, you know, you've got your last aspirin in your purse or your pocket. Wouldn't that not seem, seem inhumane not to say, here's a couple of aspirin. Here's the solution. It would seem in So what if we know that the world's dying around us and we know that the only answer is it's not on who we elect for president or governor or, or politicians. It's not upon the military. The only answer to what really is wrong in the world is Jesus. And so if we want our children to have a world that's better than the one they're in now, guess what? The answer to that is evangelism, right? Bringing more and more and more and more and more and more and more people into the body of Christ. We hear the phrase, and it's debated on how to be used or whatever. We heard, hear the phrase, radicalized Muslim, or radicalized Islamic extremists. Who are they targeting to radicalize? Young men. The indoctrination starts when they're very young. If an evil system can, ch- can convince people to detonate themselves or to die in a jihadi attempt, what could the power of God do in receptive hearts? What if we radicalize Christianity? What if we radicalize a love for Jesus? What, what, what if we really got serious about that? What if we really reflect that? What if we as a body of believers says, listen, it can't stay, it can't go on like it is. And it's about making priorities. It's about being intentional. It's about making the right choices and prioritizing the role of God and faith and Christ in your life and sharing that message to those around you. Number three. And you may say I should have started off with this. But I think that if you're teaching and you're disciplining, you're loving. I think if you ignore teaching and discipline, you're not really loving. But love your children. This biblical command really seems unnecessary. I I brought them in this world, don't I love them? There's a lot of folks in this world who don't feel loved by their parents. There's a lot of people in this world that don't feel like they are a priority to their parents. A few years ago, apparently up north, a sign off on TV that did something like this. It's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? You know, sort of, a, sort of an admonition to parents to make sure your kids were, were okay. Well, the, I heard of a study a few years ago. They were going to sort of test that theory. 
So they've been calling houses at random at 10 o'clock to see if the kids were in the house. The kids answered the phone, but the parents weren't home. Do you your parents? No, I don't know where they're at. They'll be when they get in. So there's been a sort of uh, a lack of love. And then some people bear internal scars for the people who should have loved them the most, wounded them the most. Abuse, neglect, horrible things have been done at the hands of the people who should have loved them. So that's why the biblical command is there, to love your children. In fact, it's sort of interesting in Titus, we, we referenced this last Sunday, we talked about the, the power of women in, in the body of Christ, but we referenced this last Sunday, that the older women are supposed to teach the young women how to love their husbands and, and to love their children. There's a good way and a bad way apparently, apparently to do it. And the older women are with wisdom to teach their younger sisters how to love their husband and to love their children. Now, I can look at us men and realize, yeah, somebody needs to help tear me out, <laughs> you know, because I'm a full-time project, okay? But to love your children, isn't, isn't that just nature? Isn't that just natural? And I'm here to tell you, it's not for some people. They really struggle. Some people are trying and struggle. Some people aren't trying at all. And they're failing. But it was important enough that, that Timothy told Titus to tell the older women to teach the young women how to do this. To love their children. It seems like, in some respect, it should be the most unnecessary verse to tell a mom to love her kids. But Paul says, no. There's a right way of doing it and maybe a wrong way of doing it. And we need godly women to teach other women how to do this. Why is this so important? It appears that from social research, currently what we understand is that our early attachments become the template for how we form later attachments in life. That our early experiences with our, with our parents, particularly very often the moms, becomes a template for how we relate to other attachments in life. And by extension, it appears that people even extend this to how they feel about God. How they feel attached to God. There's been a lot of, rela- if you want to sort of, you know, keep yourself busy at night reading research, or whatever, just put attachment theory in your Google search engine and you'll be thousands of articles about attachment theory. Uh, one of my colleagues, he developed an interest, he actually and reassess an instrument and revise an instrument um, that, that measures attachment. So it, it's really interesting, but it does appear these become templates. Here's some biblical background. Why do we love God? Because he first loved us. So how do we learn how to love? How do we learn how to relate? Who did it first? God did. John says we love God because he loved us. And, and so we understand that this loving relationship, there was something forming in that, some, something very important. But you know what? If you grew up in a really abusive environment, you view God as abusive. If you grew up in a really neglectful, abandoning environment, guess what? You view God as neglectful and abandoned. If you feel like you were never good enough, guess what? You feel the same way about God. I'm never good enough. If you grew up in a loving, affirming environment, affirming environment who says you're special, you're wonderful, oh, you're screwed up at times, you mess up, but listen, we forgive you, guess what? You feel, you feel God the same way. It's very hard for folks to sometimes grow beyond those early attachment experiences to view God in a healthy manner. They look at God as being punitive. They look at God as being abandoning. They look at God as being distant. They look at God as being cold. They look at God as being, being A bad parent. And time and time again, I've asked folks, and they're describing the relationship with God, you know, just not too often long ago, someone was describing her relationship with God, and this is now, okay. Now tell me, how is your relationship with God different from your relationship with your father? He said he was cold, and he was distant, and he was not there. He was neglectful. 
And she began crying. She says, that's exactly how I see God. I feel like he's so far away. He has no interest in me whatsoever. And I says, well, that's not true. That you're fearfully wondering me from aid and God knew you in your mother's womb and he loves you dearly. And he wants to show his love to you. But see, she had taken her early formative experiences and applied it to how God relates to her. And that's not the truth. We, we, we know we love God because he loves us. But sometimes we get mixed up because when in a, in a kid's in a kid's perspective, there's God. And there's mom and dad. Those are the two most powerful entities they know. There's God and there's mom and dad. But since mom and dad's the only flesh they get to experience, they begin to mix those two up and they begin to do those attributional things to God that are from their formative experiences. If our first attachments are good, then we can form healthy attachments later in life. That's so key. If our first attachments are good, then we form healthy attachments later in life. In marriage counseling, we see it all the time. It doesn't take many before people start talking about their parents and those attachments. It's okay, now, okay, now, how does that relate to your experience? If you have healthy attachments, you can form good attachments. The ideal that we have a responsibility toward how kids are treated, Luke talks about it in his gospel, and Mark talks about it in his gospel, and I think Matthew does, John doesn't. But, but I believe those three gospels all reference this verse. Jesus says, listen, if you offend one of the little ones, It would be better for you than a millstone be tied around your neck and you be cast in the depths of the sea. Okay. Now I've got, I I thought about bringing it, but I got busy this afternoon. I forgot. I got a little millstone. It's about the size of a dinner plate. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about one of those big honking millstones. Okay. That they would roll stones on top of each other to make flour. Okay. You can't swim with one of those guys. That's not like a lifesaver. That's like a lead sinker. Boom. Jesus says, if you offend a little one, it's better than that happened to you than you walk around offending anyone else. That, that, that's how serious this, this, this responsibility, that these attachment type things are important to this. Early relational wounds are very often carried out throughout life. If you hurt young, you hurt. I remember Sister Mabel Ward talked to me one time. She told me this story a couple of times, but she talked about Shirley Stockton had a store there not far from the community she grew up in and how Shirley was sort of, you know, he had a little general store there. And Mabel talked about being very poor growing up. Okay? And she would go pick, pick blackberries and, and trade with Mr. Stockton. And she said she'd pick a little vessel of blackberries and she'd go trade. And he gave her a, a soft drink or a, a candy or a pie or something like that. She says, and I know now as an adult that what I was giving him blackberries did not nearly equal what he was giving to me as a child. And she said this, she said, she, she said, Mark, she says, a child never forgets a kindness. A child never forgets a kindness. Children also never forget meanness. Those wounds can carry them throughout their life. And I think that God gave us a church family and he uses family language for some people to just get healed. Because they do carry these relational wounds. And they come into the body of Christ to be loved, to be encouraged, to be believed in. And, 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 and to be bolstered up. To let some of those wounds go. And to receive some healing. Jesus is the great physician, right? By his wounds, we are healed. And so these are very important concepts that we look at. Um, quickly, my time's past gone really, but... But four different ways people are like, they're secure attachments, people who just sort of, they feel very secure, their parental attachment. There's those who are ambivalent, they could care less, you know. And these are what toddlers demonstrate. The research was done, as, you know, toddlers are demonstrate these kind of attachments. There's avoiding attachments and there's disorganized attachment. The disorganized attachment is really interesting. When a child's distress, the mother's distress gets higher than the child's distress. So the child's stress, the mother goes to peace. Oh, my baby, you know, so like, guess what the child learns? My emotional needs are less important than your emotional needs. So the child has begin, become unstressed to comfort the mother's stress. And they become disorganized. And this comes in the foundation for some pretty strange things. They're even saying disorganized children can, 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 can some indicate early indications of schizophrenia. That, that they begin to sort of have a detached reality because their reality cannot be validated. Because their parents' reality is so distorted. Just some really long stuff. But that's where the breakdown in the, in the research. Most people securely attach. But look how many are disorganized, avoidant, ambivalent, 
35%. I mean, excuse me, not 35%, 40%. 40% of the people have some kind of unhealthy attachment in their makeup. And these are people trying to have relationships and raise families and raise kids, but they themselves are really struggling in how they're attached. So these early wounds are templates. We may begin to approach God like we do our parents. I found this passage in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31 verse 3. The Lord has appeared of old to me. Saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. What is this? It's a beautiful verse in which God's telling the prophet Jeremiah, I have loved you from always. And how I have given my loving kindness to you has drawn you to me. When God said, let us make man in our image, he indicated that in our DNA, that we are relational. So how are you attached to God? You know, I think that if you say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm securely attached to God. You know, I know he loves me. I know my relationship is right with him. I'm saved through the grace in Christ Jesus that, that he loves me. He has great plans for me. He has plans for good, not for evil for me. That God is with me. God's my sustainer. Then you have a pretty secure attachment with God. If you're feeling that maybe God doesn't love you and you feel like God's wanting to reject you and, and God's just, you know, really out to see you mess up so he can send you the fires of hell, guess what? You have a very insecure attachment with God. Jesus came so we may have our salvation assured that we can know that we were saved the relationship with through him through Christ. So the biblical concept of parenting, teach. Discipline and love. And this is the body of Christ's responsibility. It begins at home. But it extends beyond that. It extends the community of faith. You know, it extends to, to, to where we're at today here in this church. As we mentioned this morning, we are extremely fortunate to having so many young families and so many young people in this congregation that we have responsibility. I guess part of my inspiration for this lesson is, is some of the conversations I've had with the elders and sort of, you know, some of the things they want to focus on uh, in the near future. Um, and also just as a body of Christ for us to sort of get our mindset around really what our priorities need to be. That we have a commitment here uh, in this world to change. And I tell you what, this world needs changing. And we have the agent and means to do that. And that's Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight and you'd like to have prayer on your behalf, if we can assist you anyway, maybe some tonight someone would like to confess to you, Jesus as your Savior and be buried with him in baptism. Matt has selected a song for us and he's going to sing, lead us in that to this time. So if you're subject, once again, we stand in the same.